and while he was hitting me, I fell on top of his car and it got dented. He said, I take them to the field where I burn her body. The court cannot describe you any other way than the devil in the sky. Falling in love is one of the most natural and beautiful feelings in the world. But what happens when we unknowingly fall in love with the wrong person? The woman in this case thought that she had met the man of her life, only to discover that he was nothing but a narcissistic monster. But by then, it was already too late. Let's get into the cult boyfriend that threw his girlfriend's tempered body into a trash can. Carabo Mokoena was born on March 27, 1995, in Soweto, South Africa, to her parents Lolo and Tabang Mokoena. She had two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother, and was super close with her family. Her friends and family described her as a loving and caring person with a big heart. She was outgoing and friendly, and was very considerate of everyone she met. After graduating from high school in 2014, Carabo enrolled at Regency's Business School to pursue business studies and even went on to obtain her aviation license at AAFSA. It was around this time that her passion for women's and children's rights started. She would volunteer at a local women's shelter where she would talk to the women who were in abusive relationships and empower them to walk out of the situation. She was so passionate about this that she was planning to open a foundation in the future that would help abused women and children. There's power in the words that we speak to ourselves and the words that we speak to people. And the, because words are, they create. Words are creative forces. Young, beautiful, intelligent, and driven, Carabo had everything going on for her. That is, until she met a guy in October 2016 who completely ruined everything. His name was Sandley Mensoa, a 26-year-old forex trader who appeared to be doing quite well for himself. He was intelligent and successful and was not afraid to show off his flashy cars and luxurious lifestyle. He had a fleet of many cars, some limited edition, and lived in a nice, luxurious apartment. I've been having a tough time in my life, but my boys pulled through, man, to come and give me some encouragement. And this is it, another M5, this is it, right there. On top of that, he presented himself as a deeply religious guy and was even an evangelist at his church. He also ran a trading company called Trillion Dollar Legacy, where he offered courses for 6,000 South African rands, which is equivalent to $388. Building wealth through Forex and binary options trading, and our ILB club as well. Um, I'm Sandile, uh, your host. Despite the fact that he was already married and had three children that he was not taken care of, Sandile portrayed himself as the God-fearing, generous, and wealthy single guy, and Carabo completely fell for him. She thought that she had found the love of her life, but sadly, she was mistaken. The relationship between Carabo and Sandile blossomed quickly, and within two months, Carabo had moved out of her parents' home to live with Sandile in his luxurious apartment. At first, everything was going great, and the two seemed so much in love with each other. But things would soon take a drastic turn as Sandili's true colors started to show. He became arrogant, controlling, and possessive, and did everything to crush Carabo's spirit. Carabo would share with her friends and family how Sandile would abuse her emotionally and physically, and smash her phone against the wall whenever they got into an argument. In fact, one of her friends even witnessed this firsthand. When she and Carabo came home after dropping another friend at the airport, Sandili demanded to see Carabo's phone, and when she refused, he grabbed it from her and smashed it against the wall. When Carabo asked him if he was going to pay for the damaged phone, he became violent and held her by the before pushing her against the wall, saying that she had disrespected him. The violence quickly escalated, and five months into the relationship around Carabo's 22nd birthday, she was admitted in hospital with bruised shoulders and a leg and a black eye. Her family got worried when they couldn't reach her to wish her a happy birthday. The next morning, Carabo called her mother, Lolo, and told her everything that happened. I got, uh, got a call from her. She said she's in hospital. She was beaten. I cried at work. I said, but why, Karam? Why? When Lola went to see her in the hospital, she completely broke down when she saw the situation that her daughter was in. She 
begged Carabo to leave Sandile, warning that he would one day kill her. I told her straight to get up. Sandile is going to kill you. You can't go on like this. This is not toxic relationship. I don't know what to call this. Carabo reluctantly agreed to return to her family and also pressed charges against Sandile. But the day she went to the police station, a surprise was waiting for her. So apparently Sandile had gone before her and pressed charges against Carabo, accusing her of assault. Can you believe that? Carabo later left a voice note to one of her friends, telling her of what had just transpired. He got robbed in um, Brom, um, I think two days after he hit me, and um, he fell at Koboha. And he went to the police station and told them that um, that was me that uh, assaulted him. I was like, wow, you know, if someone can go to that extent. And while he was hitting me, I think I fell on top of his car and it got dented. And he told the police that I damaged his car. From her voice, you can tell that she was just completely exhausted and just wanted everything to be over so she could move on with her life. And in April 2017, it seemed like Carabo was doing just that. Her bruises were now healed and she was slowly building her life. Then on April 27th, 2017, Carabo and her girlfriends decided to go out to a local nightclub. And while they were having a good time and enjoying themselves, Sandil showed up. A fight soon broke out between the two, and for some unknown reason, they left the club together and went to Sandil's place. The CCTV camera at the apartment building captured the two arriving home at 2.48 a.m. And from the footage, you can see Carabo was still upset about the fight at the club. And chillingly, this would be the last time that she would ever be seen alive again. Carabo's mom tried calling her daughter around this time, but when she picked up, she was whispering and told her mom that she couldn't talk and she would call her back later, but she never did. Later that day, Carabo's family started getting worried when they couldn't get a hold of her. They called her friends to ask where Carabo was, and the friends told them that she had gone home with Sandil. Carabo's sister and one of her friends decided to go over to Sandil's apartment and look for her there. When they got there, Sandil was not around, and so they decided to ask the people around if they had seen Carabo. A security guard told them that the cleaning crew had found an ID and passport of a lady called Carabo in a trash can when they were cleaning the fourth floor of the building, which is where Sandil Sandil's apartment was located. Around this time, they saw Sandil driving in with another lady and Carabo's sister went out to confront him, asking him where her sister was. Sandil completely dismissed her, saying that he knew nothing about her sister's whereabouts and that she was out hiding in some hotel somewhere. Carabo's sister would later say that this is when she knew that something was wrong. She went back home and told her family everything that had happened, and they all went to the police and reported Carabo missing. Carabo's mom also called Sandile and asked him what he had done to her daughter, and his reply was really chilling. He told her, and I quote, I don't know where she is, but I didn't kill her. That's not sus at all! The next day was on March 29th, and Carabo's mom and sister went to Sandile's apartment with the police, hoping to see the CCTV footage. When they arrived, Sandile was not around, so they decided to give him a call. He told them that he was at a funeral somewhere, but would try to meet them later in the evening. And since this was the last place that Carabo had been seen, the family decided to wait for him. Meanwhile, as the police were reviewing the CCTV footage of the day Carabo went missing, they saw Carabo and Sandile go into the apartment, but they never saw her leave. At around 10 p.m., Sandile goes into his apartment with a trash can, and then a few minutes later, he comes out pulling the now seemingly heavy container. He goes directly to the garage and then drives out of the apartment. When Sandile returned home that evening, the police asked to search his apartment, and he willingly allowed them. While they were inside, they noticed a wet patch on his carpet, and when they examined it, they realized that it was blood. Sandile was immediately arrested and taken in for questioning. While at the station, Sandile confessed to killing Carabo and throwing her in a trash can and driving out to burn her in a field. He confessed to me that no, 15. I kill my girlfriend. How? He said, I take them to the field where I burn her body. How did you burn her? He said, it was acid, petrol, tire that I used to burn the body. 
However, Sandile later retracted his statement and denied ever confessing to anything. Since he had not signed the confession, it was his word against the officer. He then told a different story to another officer, claiming that Carabo had taken her own life. He claimed that when he returned home on April 28th, he found Carabo in a pool of blood after she had herself. He said that he thought no one would believe him, and so he decided to dispose of her remains and burn them. In yet another version, he claimed that he and Carabo had been involved in some type of blood ritual to help his business. Apparently, the ritual was supposed to give them both wealth and fortune as a couple, but if they ever broke up, one of them had to die. This man is totally insane. After this confession, the police had to go out and tell Carabo's family members who were waiting outside that their daughter had passed. And as you can imagine, they were totally devastated. The next day, Sandile took the police to where he disposed of Carabo's body, although it had already been removed and was lying unidentified in a morgue completely burned beyond recognition. In fact, it would take several days for the remains to be identified as Carabo. The news of Carabo's gruesome death caused a huge uproar on social media. Her funeral was attended by hundreds of people, including government officials, who condemned the brutality and asked people to stand and talk against women and children abuse. Meanwhile, Sandil stood trial for premeditated murder and assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. And just like a classic narcissist, he showed no remorse for his actions and even tried to pin the blame on Carabo, accusing her of all manner of things. He even claimed arrogantly that he was a positive influence on Carabo's life. I tried to be a positive influence in her life, but it's unfortunate that I came into her life at a point where things were already bad. So yeah, maybe I'm guilty of trying to build a person and being the last one there when she collapsed, you know. So the, the truth of the matter is I, I, I tried my best. He also accused the police of fabricating evidence and trying to pin the murder on him. He claimed that one officer had even asked him for a bribe so that he could make everything go away. He went on to brag about how he lived in a posh apartment and that the officers had found money lying all over his house when they came to search it. I mean, this guy is just something else. As it turned out, his wealth was not even legit. A lot of people came forward claiming that Sandile had scammed them off a lot of money. And given what we already know about him, I'm not really that surprised. On May 3rd, 2018, Sandile was found guilty of the charges and was sentenced to a total of 32 years in prison without parole. Uh, the court cannot describe you in any other way than a devil in the sky. She did not deserve to perish at your hands in the way that she did. Your cold-heartedness towards the deceased is evident from your conduct after you killed her. You went on with your life as if nothing was wrong and nothing happened. What do you think about this case? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.